So again, welcome. This is Matt Buckman here, Director of Referee Development for Cal North. Uh, we're going to dig into mass confrontations tonight, and we're going to really just focus on watching some clips. Uh, we're all regional referees here, which means we've gotten some training on um, the idea of triangulation when you have a mass confrontation, uh, making sure that you create a triangle around a, a situation so that you have three vantage points from it. We've discussed when to come on the field, how to come on the field. Uh, and so I'm not going to go through a list of considerations or anything like that. We're just going to spend our time tonight watching clips. I also don't have any polls set up for tonight. Normally I work really hard to try to get your input on these clips, but because they're, they're mass confrontation and because they're not individual decisions where I can say, you know, is this yes or is this no, uh, this topic doesn't really lend itself to polling. So I apologize uh, that there won't be any voting or any decision making tonight, but I do uh, strongly encourage you to use the chat feature uh, to submit any questions you might have, be they clarifying, be they more editorial, whatever it might be. Uh, feel free to submit those questions via chat if there's something uh, that, that you're not sure about, if you're unsettled about. Uh, with with the clips that we look at tonight. So I'm going to get us away from this over to our clips. So I'm going to start with what is a good example of how a referee crew managed the mass confrontation. So that's the bulk of it there. I'm going to watch it one more time all the way through, let everybody pick, pick it up one more time, and then I'll break down what the referees did well here on this clip. All right, so this is obviously a, a difficult area of the field where this happens. It's right in front of the technical areas, which is obviously a hot spot for us. Uh, a couple of warning signs that this was about to happen, and you can see the referee's body language change quite a bit as it goes. Uh, one of the warning signs that we might have something happen is the frequency of challenges that we have. So if we have a, a, a number of successive challenges that come right in a row, bam, 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 that means the energy is going up, the temperature is going up, the likelihood of a problem is going up because we're having a series of challenges repeatedly in a tight space. And so when you watch this clip, you have one challenge there, another challenge, another challenge, another challenge, another challenge, and that's the, the moneymaker right there. So we have five challenges in the course of about two or three seconds here that all are escalating. And as you can see here, the referee has closed his proximity to these as they happen. So he's good proximity, good proximity. And then we have this one. The next thing the referee does well at this moment is his urgency. Look how immediately he's running in. That puts him at a great advantage here because he already closes the distance once you get these players starting to react and rush in. If this referee doesn't react quickly, if he's standing out here, when these players start to rush the guilty party here, he's not gonna get there in time to actually prevent this from getting really bad. As it is, he barely gets there in time because a guy gets in his way. You can see this player gets in his way and he's gotta move around him to get there. But he still manages to get there just in time to put his body between the guilty party and everybody else who wants to get to him. So the urgency and the positioning there when this happens 
is the first thing that this referee does really, really well. Already you're seeing the reaction there and the urgency. The player's not even on the ground yet. Really excellent work to react that quickly and anticipate it and get moving in there. The second technique that this referee does, and this is only something I would, I would ask regional referees to do uh, who are really, really experienced and really, really comfortable, is he actually uses his body to create uh, a physical barrier. Now, we talk a lot at the grassroots level about never touching players. The more advanced we get, the more we get into men's amateur, things like that, the more potentially those rules can relax. I know it's always not a good thing and you have to be careful to do it. I wouldn't suggest if you're out at, uh, you know, an unaffiliated match somewhere, which you're not supposed to be refereeing, but if you're out at an unaffiliated match somewhere, I would not suggest you do this because those are going to get out of control. But if you're in a higher level youth competition, if you're at a higher level uh, adult competition and you can get in between two players before they really get going, that's going to help you to prevent this. And like I said, the referee barely gets here. And the only reason he can do this is because he's in a professional environment. I would say if you're in a men's amateur game and you have to run and get into the middle like this, I would not suggest you do it. But if you're in a more controlled environment and you can, this referee does a really good job of getting his body in between the two players who in that moment are really upset with each other. And then he continues on with a tactic that I love to see referees do and very few do them. This player, number 14, is our guilty party. He's the one that everybody's going to want to go and have a go at right now because he's the one who committed the actual challenge. Number 14 is the guilty party. The referee recognizes that, recognizes that everybody's going to have a go at him. And so he runs in, he puts his body between that guilty party and everybody else, and then he steers him out of the pack. He actually helps to move him out of the pack of players and then continues to keep his body between everybody else and that guilty party. And as you watch this progress, notice how he never takes his hand off of him. He always knows where that player is. He's not going to let him go. He's not going to let him get past him. He keeps his hand on him the entire time. And you can actually see he's got his hand wrapped around him. That's a little secret that you can do. He's actually got a hold of him there. I've actually personally had to use this tactic before where I just have a fist full of somebody's jersey and I don't let him go because everybody else is trying to get at him. So at this point, he's not letting go of this player. He's keeping his body there. He's making sure he knows where that player is at all times. And when we zoom in again on this, you can see he's still got his hand on him, still got his arm on him, still has his arm on him. He's not letting that guy go anywhere. So this is a really great technique of using your body as a physical barrier when everybody's still reasonably under control to keep something like this from escalating any further than it already was. And then to keep a constant awareness of where this player is, make sure that you always know he's not going to go in and get more. You can see he's still creating a barrier. Even though this player is not looking to go anymore, he's still making sure he doesn't. So a lot of really excellent work here from the referee in particular. Now we can talk a little bit about the AR's involvement here. Fourth official, as you can see, comes right in. Ideally would have come in and make sure that coach couldn't come on, but it looks like the coach being passive, so that's okay. Fourth official is right, if you didn't notice there, is moving now. You can see here he's moving to the left when we play it in real time. He's going to block anybody else from coming out onto the field. So the fourth official does a really excellent job. You can see the AR already coming across, recognizing this is a high impact area, already starting to make his way. And the other AR, I'm pretty sure, we never see him in the camera, which means I think he's probably over here, making sure nobody else on the other bench comes over. But there's one thing that the other AR, the AR2 does very, very well, which is, it's a, it happens in a few seconds. He comes into the picture, and he deals with the only other real problem at this moment. You can see him. He's got a triangle. He's making sure he has a good angle of view on everything. And then out of nowhere, the other goalkeeper comes flying in from about 70 yards away. This is a problem. Because the other goalkeeper was in the picture, but he's helping break people up. And it's in his half of the field. 
this goalkeeper has run 70 yards and is immediately confrontational. You can see the referee telling him to get back. This player is immediately confrontational. And look how the AR goes over and engages him right away and says, you got to move. And he pushes him out of this situation. So it's great awareness from this assistant referee to recognize that that's a new addition to the problem. And if we don't deal with it, we're going to have additional problems. So he does really well to recognize that threat to the situation, go in, intercept it, and push it away. So all in, a really nice job from this crew. And when we go back and we watch this, this is really a case study for what to do with mass confrontations that happen in front of the left bench. What we want to see from a technique perspective or from a theory perspective is in this situation, fourth official moves over and worries about this bench and makes sure nobody else comes on. AR1 stays probably somewhere in this area, but has their focus on the bench behind them to make sure nobody comes on the field there. And AR2 runs across and helps the referee manage this situation. So really excellent work there. If the same mass, mass confrontation happens on the other side of midfield, then the theory we would look for there is AR1 jumps onto the field, fourth official comes this direction and worries about the bench to the right, and the AR2, as they're running in, has their attention focused on this bench to make sure nobody else is entering the field. So a lengthy description there, and I'll pause and answer any questions here. We had a question here. The whistle in his teeth makes me worry for his safety. A probably a fair concern. We're seeing more and more referees um, keep no lanyard or anything and just have the whistle there. So it is uh, uh, an area concern. So uh, Bill Keeney and Dwan, or Don, excuse me, I specifically asked you not to make comments and you guys have made comments. So please, do not make comments in the chat feature, only ask questions. Same thing, Paulo, don't ask, don't make comments. So we had a question here, can we define controlled environment? Is it a sanctioned game? I don't understand what that question means, Sonny, so please rephrase it. Stuart, a very good question here. How do we handle coaches coming on the field uninvited? That has to be, um, a little bit of, of a feel. You have to smell the right situation. If you have coaches coming on to the field in a situation like this, and the only thing they're doing is grabbing their players and getting them out of the, the, the situation, then I think you have to welcome that. You have, to, you have to welcome their presence there because they're trying to be helpful. Is it ideal that they're on the field? Of course not. But when it happens right there and they, they have to take a step or two on to grab one of their own players and get them out of the situation, I think we should welcome that because they're a, a positive influence on that situation. Now, if the coach is in there yelling and screaming at players, if he's in there grabbing a hold of an opponent, we're probably going to have to send them off because we don't want that happening there. But again, you're going to have to smell that one to some degree. If everybody's ganging up on, on one opponent and he grabs that guy and gets him out of there and is trying to protect him, do we want to punish him for that? Probably not. So again, we have to, we have to really read the situation and try to figure out, is that coach trying to have a positive influence or a destabilizing influence? And if he's trying to help, give him that latitude. I, I think in, in these moments, we can use all the help we can get. So we had a question here at what time should the AR2 have entered the field? As soon as he recognized that this was turning into a mass confrontation, which it very clearly was, he immediately starts to come in. So I don't think he was premature here in any way. I think he recognized he's still there. He's still there. Once he sees a whole bunch of people, and again, we can't see the whole screen at this point, but there are probably everybody, all you know, 22 players at this point are running to the same spot. Once he recognizes that, he starts to go. So he has timed this very, very well here. Question here, does the referee reach for his pocket for a card and then reconsider? The answer is yes. He starts to reach for the yellow card, thinking he's going to show it. And then I think he realizes that he's going to need his hands to break up this fight. And so he doesn't pull the card out so that he can keep his hands free for going in and breaking up the mass confrontation. So I don't think he reconsiders. I think he's always going to give a yellow card here. 
appropriately so. But I think he recognizes he's going to need his hands free to be able to, to resolve this situation. And yes, Randy, your question, if he does uh, put the card away, does he come back later to sanction the foul? The answer is absolutely yes. So Sonny, a question here. We shouldn't use our hand to hold the guilty player if it's a women's game. Well, if you're a woman, then yes. But if you're a man, no, I would not suggest you do that. We have to be very, very careful with the opposite gender of, of touching them. We probably shouldn't do that. But we can try to get our body in between with our arms stretched out wide so that if anybody's touching anybody, they're touching you and you're not touching them. If you just you know wade in between them with your arms straight out, using your body to create a barrier, no one can accuse you of touching or handling the players. They're actually doing it to you. So a question here from Steven, is it helpful to be sitting on the whistle while running in as a distraction or attempt to get them back to their senses or does it escalate things? It's a very, very good question. Um, I personally, as a referee, when I was younger, was trained when you're dealing with a mass confrontation, just keep blowing the whistle over and over and over again and suddenly that's going to irritate them enough that they'll stop. Um, I would not advise you to do that. Couple, you know, he, the referee is going to blow the whistle here pretty hard because of the nature of the foul. He's going to run in. He's going to blow it a couple times. But if at some point that doesn't work, then just stop. Because the other thing is if you're blowing the whistle, you can't be talking to players. And you need to be talking to players to help them to get them to calm down. So the more you blow the whistle, the less you can be talking to players. Um, reading through a couple other, does the orange goalkeeper deserve a caution for running? The answer to that is yes. Per the laws of the game, if the goalkeeper leaves the penalty area to participate in a mass confrontation, they need to be given a yellow card. But again, we need to smell that a little bit. If, if the goal, like for example, the, the, this goalkeeper, he runs in, he's getting his players, he's getting them out of the situation. We don't want to punish people for that. That's positive influence. This other goalkeeper runs in and starts yelling at people. Yeah, absolutely. Book him. And I think if I play this forward, the referee in this situation does give a yellow card to this goalkeeper. Last question here. Given the tempo and quick succession of tackles, do you think the referee should have whistled the white player tackle right before this incident? Um, I don't think so. That wasn't a reaction that I had, but let me go back and, and play it one more time. No, that's a very clean challenge. They're, they're, you can't make up a foul here just because there's quick succession. So there actually has to be a foul. And this is a very, very legal challenge. You can see he's got his foot right behind the ball, fair tackle. I don't think you can call a foul there for that. That's all very good. So uh, good question to ask, though. Uh, question here, while the referee is protecting number 14, if there are multiple groups of arguments and fights going on, how does the referee team handle identifying players who need to be cautioned and sent off? It's a very, very good question, actually. So if you've got multiple scrums, what I would suggest is if you can hold on to the person who's going to be at the center of it, I would suggest you do that. Otherwise, back out. Once it grows beyond what you and one other person can handle, it's time to back out and let them sort it out. If they want to act like buffoons, if they want to get themselves sent off, that's their problem. It's not yours. So once it grows to be too much for one or two people to handle on their own, you back out and then you just watch. And the, the best guidance I can offer you for misconduct afterward, unless there's something really severe, like one player punches somebody in the face and everybody else just is holding on and trying to talk it down, except for in extreme situations, Try your best to balance out the misconduct. If you've got a big scrum like this one was, you should probably try to come out of this with two cautions. One for the guy who was guilty originally and one for somebody else who, who went at him. So in this situation, what I would suggest is, yeah, yellow card for this guy for the initial foul, but then it's this player right here who goes and actually creates the problem that you probably want to get for a caution as well. So after all of this, leaving the goalkeeper out of the equation for a second, the goalkeeper in orange. If this whole thing happens, we should probably just come back and caution these two guys. One for the committing the foul and this guy for starting a mass confrontation. Everybody else is in there, not really guilty of anything. They're holding people back. They're calm. Yeah, they all come together, but nobody really does anything stupid. So nobody else is really guilty of anything in this situation. It's just that one player 
who actually started the mass confrontation by getting into the guilty player's face. So come out of this one with equal number of cautions to the best degree that you can. So, but again, you know, let's pretend one of this, this guy who, uh, who came in, let me get the, the cursor back here. This guy who came in and, and actually, you know, started the mass confrontation. If this guy commits the yellow card foul here and this guy comes up and just headbutts him right here, boom, he headbutts him. We're not going to try to even out and have two red cards in this situation. So you can't always find parity when you can find it. But if one player is clearly just far more guilty of something excessive than everybody else, then you would just have to send off the one player. So don't, don't live and die by having to find parity, but when you can, go ahead and do it. Question here, if the amount of successive challenges increases in tight places, such as having three to five challenges in seconds, should the referee get more vocal for management? That is a technique you can use. Easy, you know, careful language like that. Um, we have to be careful with interjecting our voice because sometimes coaches will get frustrated if we get involved in the wrong ways. So for example, if we say, don't foul here, don't foul, that's coaching and we shouldn't be doing that. We should be saying things like, be careful, things like that that are more focused on player safety. But sometimes a coach may want a player to commit a foul. And if you're saying, don't foul, don't foul, that's not really your prerogative because there are tactical fouls that coaches want their players to take sometimes. So be careful with how you get involved. But yes, at the end of the day, you can get involved there ver verbally. All right. So that was uh, a lengthy discussion for one clip. A lot to look at in this one, but ultimately a job well done here. So I'll move us on to the next one. So I'm playing one more time. So while this doesn't really blow up on us at all, it is a mass confrontation. And there are some things this referee could have done differently as it started to prevent it from happening. And then there are some techniques that the referee could have improved upon. So the first thing has to do with the positioning and where the referee runs. So in this, he's called, he's, he's picked up that there's a foul there. And then we have this happen. Now, the referee, this, this I would say, is a, a pretty terrible challenge, actually. I, I would argue that there needs to be a caution for this. It's a two-footed tackle. You can see here these studs are going to the trail leg, nowhere near the ball. This is a cautionable offense for this challenge. So the first mistake or the first area for improvement this referee had was where he actually runs. He doesn't recognize that this is an inflammatory tackle. And instead, runs back to the spot of the first foul. Now, the problem with that is now these, all these players are together. And he's standing way over here. So if there are any problems that happen out of this, which one might assume there is after a tackle like that, we don't want to run and position ourselves five to six yards away from where everybody else is. Particularly when we've got our choice of fouls that we can call. If he had blown the, uh, a foul for that tackle, which notice this guy thought he should, he can run to the spot of this foul right here and lend his presence to everything that happens afterwards. So he can hear, if he's standing there, that these players are starting to chirp. 
and he can get in and keep this from happening before this ever actually happens. So there's a preventative measure we could have done here to help. Now, by the time he gets there, there's too many players there for him to get involved, so he's going to stay out of it. He recognizes he can't, and so he backs out. No problem there. But then the next thing that he does here is before this is fully settled, meaning we still have players coming into the fray here, before this is fully settled, he's already telling this player, number 20, to go over where he wants him to go. He's telling him, go over there, go over there, except that the guy doesn't do it. And so now he's got to blow the whistle and tell him to come here. But we still have all these guys getting in with each other to some degree. Now, they're not pushing and shoving, but they're still together, which means something else might be able to happen. So as a general practice, we don't want to begin isolating a player to have a conversation, which this referee is doing here. He's pulling this guy all the way out when there's still more to go to deal with out of the camera angle here. So it might seem the same as what the last referee did, but there's a key difference. Nobody's going at this guy anymore. The last referee get the guy out of the equation because people were still going at him, and then he held him there because the guy was still trying to go back at times. This is not that situation. He is backed out of the equation. He's no longer trying to prevent. Now he's just observing. So once we, we pass that threshold and we move into just observation, we need to observe it until it's done. Don't start sorting out what's going to happen. Don't start moving players. Don't start talking to one player while the rest of it's going on. Watch it until it's fully resolved. Then insert, get the players separated, get them off into their own areas, and then pull the players, this guy that you want to have a conversation with, over to the side. So the best possible outcome for this one is actually not to have any misconduct for the mass confrontation itself. There was never a lot of pushing and shoving. There was a little bit of jawing at each other. There was a chest bumped a little bit, but it was pretty minor. We don't need any kind of yellow cards for anything that anybody did after the whistle was blown. What I would suggest, though, is that the nature of this challenge is such that we needed to have a yellow card. Now, the referee is not able to see this. We're talking about positioning here. Remember that when you're in the attacking third, we don't want you ahead of play. The referee needed to let play pass him by back here. So ideally, the referee is back here at this point, not ahead of play. We're getting into the attacking third now. We don't want to be ahead of play in the attacking third. If the referee is not ahead of play, he's going to be positioned back here, which means he's going to have a perfect view of the nature of that tackle. He can't see it from where he's at because the chest or the, the body cavity of this player is blocking him. So he misses the fact that this is a cautionable offense. So the only misconduct we look to have out of this one is a yellow card for a reckless challenge. The rest of the confrontation is insignificant enough that we don't need to have any misconduct. Questions on that? So the first question here, should the referee call the second foul rather than the first one? I would say yes, absolutely. The, the, there are two fouls that occurred here. This one is significantly worse than the, than the first one, so we should go for that one. But even if you're doing a wait and see here, if you see that there was a foul committed back here, you're going to do a wait and see to see if a potential advantage comes up. If you do a wait and see and a player is fouled a second time, always take the second one. Because would you rather a free kick here? or a free kick here. Ideally, we would have a free kick here. So another question, his initial positioning probably allowed the scrum to escalate. Absolutely correct. And I would say his initial positioning after he blows the whistle is why it started. If he had been here at the spot of the foul after he blew the whistle, he would have heard the player starting to jaw and he could have left his or, or lent his presence and his voice to get that to calm down. Those two players would have never come together had he been standing there. Question here, can there be a, a card for the first foul, not playing the ball at all, tactical? The answer to that is no. The, there's there's no, none of the considerations present for stopping a promising attack at this one. So at that foul right there, if we were going to try to say stopping a promising attack, we would have to question, first of all, the number of defenders, 
there are more defenders than there are attackers, which means there's no numerical advantage. There's no space. There's no time. There's no options. There's really nothing present here for Spa except possession of the ball. So if this player had gone to ground here, unless you wanted to say it was reckless, which if he'd have made enough contact with him from the back there to actually put him to ground, maybe you can have an argument for a reckless challenge, but definitely not stopping a promising attack. Question here, would the choice of the second foul still be if the first foul was cautionable? I would say if the first foul would, was cautionable, it, the player would have been on the ground. The second foul would have never happened if the first foul had been cautionable because to make it cautionable, the player would have likely had to take enough contact to be on the ground. So I don't know you get the second one if the first foul is actually worth the caution. All right, I'm going to move us on to another one now. So play that one more time. I love this guy over here, the guy who starts all this, pushing and shoving players, holding on to players, and then gets upset that people are touching him. I love it. <laughs> so we're going to talk about why this mass confrontation happened because there's a, a, a key technique here that the referee uh, doesn't utilize here that actually leads this to happen. So it's a pretty terrible tackle, obviously. I got the cursor out of the way there. We watch this one more time. It's a pretty terrible tackle. Now, when it happens, everybody expects it to be a foul. There's no real reaction. The only reaction you get is this guy saying he got the ball. The orange players aren't really reacting at all to the severity of this because the body language of the referee makes it look like he's going to take care of it. He rushes in there, a big whistle. He calls on the trainer. Everybody's fine. Look at the body language of everybody here in orange is fine. When the body language escalates is when the referee goes a long period of time without displaying any misconduct. So the entire reason that this player comes in here and starts to jaw and draw the attention of everybody else is because the referee hasn't made a decision yet and displayed it relating to the misconduct. This player, the longer the referee waits, the more this player thinks he's not going to give a caution. Look, this guy, the, the player who started this is nowhere near any of this. And the moment that he escalates is when he pulls this guy aside in a way that suggests, I'm just going to give you a warning. And now he comes in and says, no, 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 there has to be misconduct here. And now he's telling the referee that has to be a card. And now everybody else gets upset because the appearance of this guy buying a card. So now the whole mass confrontation starts because this player feels strongly there should be a yellow card. And these guys take offense to this player trying to influence the referee. None of this happens if the referee just issues the misconduct. So the, le the lesson we can learn from this, there's a few lessons, but the primary lesson we can learn from this is when we have a tackle that is this bad and it's behind, scissors the back leg, I would argue it's a sending off offense. But even if it's just a yellow card in your mind, 
If you run in there and bam, you hit the yellow card or the red card, whatever you deem is appropriate, nothing else happens after this. These guys stop bickering with you as much. You're confident. You make the decision. You display it. They're going to fuss with you, but you can fuss with them. No problem. Nobody from the orange team comes in and gets involved in this if you don't display the yellow card right now. If you just give it, everybody's okay. They go there, check on the player. They move on with it. The delay that the referee uses here is actually what causes this problem because he is not taking a decision. And now we have a mass confrontation. So what we would probably want to do here, because this guy doesn't really do anything that bad and nobody really does anything that bad, the ideal scenario here is we give a yellow card or a red card to the guilty player for the tackle and we move on because everything else stayed pretty calm. We don't need to go back to anything on this. Now, what makes this in my mind a red card is not the, the stud because it actually goes in front of the foot, but it's the fact that he goes so far through the tackle and the full weight of his body actually comes down on that ankle on the planted foot and causes it to fold underneath. That can break a leg really easily because of how far through the tackle he actually goes. The reason the referee isn't sure is because of his positioning. You're going to see a consistent thread when we're talking about referees who don't make confident decisions on this conduct. The primary reason is usually their positioning. So as we see here, the referee is running in a calm manner. He has to adjust his positioning a little bit because he sees a potential challenge coming here and he knows this player is in the way. And to do that, he runs forward at pace and now he's got in a bad spot and he has to keep running so he doesn't get hit with the ball. Ideally, we wouldn't be inside the penalty area like this at this moment. Ideally, we would be out here somewhere. And so what the referee can do to improve his position is recognize he needs a better angle of view and sidestep either direction. I would argue to the middle would be better, but we have zone 14 to worry about, so maybe not. But just a quick sidestep to this spot means at this moment, if he's here looking at this with the perfect angle of view, now when the ball comes, Instead of having to run that direction, he can just take a step. And then as he sees this challenge coming, he can be moving in this direction. So ideally, the referee stays here, doesn't continue running into the penalty area, and instead moves back into this direction. Because at the moment this tackle happens, this guy is very likely blocking his view. He can't see because he's looking at it instead of through it. He can't see how bad of a tackle this actually is. So positioning here causes a big problem, but at the end of the day, the referee not showing this card quickly or even reasonably quickly leads to a mass confrontation. Questions on this one? Give me a second here to read them. So question here, if the same exact incident occurred later in the game involving the same two individuals and they've been causing other problems throughout the game, would you then consider giving them a caution? It really depends. You know, honestly, that's going to be a feel for the game scenario. It's a very good question. If the guy who comes in and actually starts this mass confrontation has been a problem the entire game, meaning you've been, he's been bickering with players, he's been a problem, if this guy's been a problem the whole game and he does this, yeah, maybe that's the end of the road. Maybe he gets a yellow card. But now we're not going to have a yellow card for what he's doing, but the fact that he's done it persistently. And hopefully you've talked to him about this before you get to this moment in the game. So if this is a repeat offense from this player, then yes, absolutely. Go ahead and book him because now he's just consistently causing problems. So we had a question here, is the referee telling the orange player to get away or is he pointing him out to the fourth official? I think he's telling him to get away and he's, he's specifically saying go away. Having the card out in your hand, you can use it, but having it out, is that the technique? Uh, no, Brian, actually, I would suggest that you just show the yellow card here because again, enough time elapses. 
So if you come back here, an ideal situation, if you see it clearly, is that you just run in and you've got the yellow card out and you just, you just display it right away. Boom. Everybody knows it. Everybody can relax a little bit. So what I would suggest is run in and at this moment right here, show the yellow card. If that's the direction you're going to go, yellow card, boom, show the yellow card. Now everybody can know, bring the yellow card down, call for the trainer. Get it done quickly and early so that everybody knows what the decision is. The longer you wait to display the card, the more the players will try to influence you and the more you will appear to have been suffering from their influence, no matter which direction you go. If you decide this is a red card, but you show it 10, 15 seconds after it happens and you've been uh, cajoled a little bit by the team in orange, then this team in gray is not ever going to believe you that you had red card from the start. The longer you wait, this is a general idea, the longer you wait to show it, the more you appear to be influenced by everybody around you. Question here, it appears to be the same referee than the last, as the last one who handled the mass confrontation well. What do you think could have influenced his less than perfect handling of this situation? That's a very good question. This is, in fact, the same referee, now an MLS referee, actually. This is his first year as a bargaining unit referee. The difference between the last clip and the clip before that was he saw it clearly. Victor, the reason that he actually uh, delays here and causes this mass confrontation is because he doesn't see the tackle and he doesn't know if it's a yellow card or a red card. His uncertainty about the misconduct is what leads him to wait too long to make the decision because he's trying to replay it in his head and frankly guess what the right answer is. That delay is what actually leads to the mass confrontation. Once the mass confrontation itself starts, he handles it fine. It's the fact that he could have prevented it from happening to begin with by just showing the caution early. We have a question here. Let's say we have issued the caution for the gray player. Should we then reprimand Orange's captain at all for coming over and starting problems? I would actually suggest that if you show the yellow card at the appropriate time, the Orange captain never comes in and actually gets involved with you at all. So I think you prevent any involvement from this player by showing the yellow card or the red card, whatever decision you make. But at the end of the day, if this guy comes in after you show the yellow card, now we're talking about a potential dissent situation and you can judge that accordingly at the time. Question here, would the fourth official be able to help? I'm guessing Juan, you meant with the foul itself. The answer to that is no, because as you see here, the fourth official is going to be back at midfield. He's going to be looking through the back of this player, which means he has no idea what the mode of contact is, what the point of contact is. There's no way he can glean any information other than, wow, that looked pretty nasty. So he's not going to be able to help the referee with any kind of misconduct. We had a question here. What if you're not sure if it's red or yellow, so you need to take care of the player first? That's a touchy one. And what I'm going to suggest is, is a bit more advanced here. If you just truly don't know, taking time isn't going to help you figure it out. If you saw it clearly and it's a true orange card and you need to process it in your head, that's different because you saw it and you're reprocessing in your head what you saw. You're replaying it in your head to analyze what you saw. In this case, the referee just doesn't know. And if you just don't know, then you can't give red because you can't send a player off if you don't know for sure what happened. Now, if you give yellow and one of your teammates comes in and says, I had a crystal clear view of that, it needs to be red, you can always overturn your decision. It's going to be ugly. It's not going to look good. But if it's just fundamentally wrong and somebody else can help you with that, you can always change the decision. But if you simply don't know, meaning, which I think is what happened with this one, you're in a bad position, you just couldn't see it, you don't know what the answer is, you know you can't go with a red card because you can't send a player off for something you didn't see clearly, which means you're going to go with a yellow, which means get the yellow out and just do it. If it's going to keep a mass confrontation from starting, just do it. Question here, if this was Orange's first offense, should we just talk with him before the kick, after the kick, or just tell him to go away? You can tell him to go away 
in this case, I would suggest because it led to three or four other players having to engage with him, I would say pulling him aside and saying, look, don't come in and get come at me would be perfectly fine. But again, that's going to be a feel for the game. We're 54 minutes in and we don't know what happened in the previous 54 minutes. Question here, should the fourth official get involved regarding the misconduct? The answer to that is no. Uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, the fourth official would not actually be able to see this. And so there would be no way for the fourth official to help with this one. There's just simply no way for the fourth official to have an angle of view to actually see the, the decision. So we've got time for one more clip. I'm going to move on to this one here. I'm not going to play the whole clip, obviously, because it's almost a four minute clip. So we're going to come back here. Now we'll start over. We've got about 90 seconds worth of clip. I'm not going to play it through another time. There's a lot to pick up on, so I'll just walk you through it as we go here. The first thing from this referee is we have to recognize that this is a pretty cynical foul. This is a pretty nasty foul. No real ability to play the ball here. No real attempt to play the ball. They're frustrated. That's an obvious just frustration foul. You can see the white team here is frustrated. They didn't get a foul called there. A couple players are frustrated. That guy is a frustrated player, comes in, doesn't get there in time, and then commits that tackle. That's a nasty tackle. And we need to have awareness of these situations when we're going to escalate. It's 3-0, 32 minutes in. The team in blue is the team winning 3-0. The losing team gets frustrated. You can see this player is frustrated that they're not getting a foul and immediately runs and tries to get stuck in and then immediately comes to do it again. So we talked about the number of challenges in quick succession. We talk about 3-0. We talk about a player who's frustrated. There's enough warning signs here that this player is going to do something stupid that we need to recognize it. And then once he commits that tackle, which is a pretty nasty tackle, we can't just stand here and look at it and act like nothing's going to be wrong. We have to show a lot more urgency to this. And we have to be aware of who everybody's going to go at. This is the guy who committed the original foul. So who do you think everybody's going to go and try to target for this? Yet the referee has his attention focused on this player who's frustrated about something and completely misses the fact that this guy's coming to confront him. So when you have a challenge of this nature, we need to be aware that there might be repercussions for it. We need to focus our attention here. We should have been moving with a much more explosive urgency towards this foul, because this is a nasty foul. We don't do that, which leads to that. And again, even after that happens, we got a guy in midair, the referee still doesn't react with any urgency. It's a little jog, nothing more. We have to be sprinting in here. Compare that body language to the first clip that we saw, where the referee runs in at pace with urgency and shows 
that he understands the severity of the situation. We had a guy just get hit in the face and this referee doesn't give us any more than a job. And then it's too late. His lack of urgency means it's too late. There's nothing we can do about this now. It's gone. Contrast that with the first referee that we saw. If this referee runs at pace, recognizes the severity of this, he very likely beats this player to this confrontation. And if he gets in there and he puts his body, this player never has the opportunity to lash out and hit him in the face. This never happens if the referee shows the appropriate urgency to get to this situation. So we could have prevented this whole nightmare, including this player ultimately getting sent off by showing some urgency and recognizing the severity of this foul and recognizing all the warning flags that we had ahead of time. Now we move into how we've handled the situation. There are some positives in here. We do have the AR getting in and getting the guilty party out of the way. So this AR recognizes the severity. He recognizes everybody's going to go for this guy. And so he goes and he isolates him. And he used the same tactic we talked before. He's got his hand on him. He's not letting him go. That's the guy we got to worry about. That's the guy you're going to send off. We've got a, an AR with his hand on him the whole time. So really excellent work there. Once you get to this point, this is too big of a confrontation for the referees to try to get in and actually stop. So instead, we get the one guy that matters out of the situation. But now notice we have two goalkeepers. This was the goalkeeper who was close to it. This was not. And he immediately runs in and goes at the guilty party. For anybody who's curious, this is now the goalkeeper coach at the Sac Republic. So already we have got a problem there. We could argue this is probably a problem, but I have a feeling these two players know each other based on their body language and their posture. And Adekora actually is a former MLS guy. He's a journeyman. He's, he's an older player. This is a player who's trying to keep everybody calm, get them out of situation. Pretty sure they know each other. So we can look at that and think that's a problem. But in reality, this guy was trying to create more problems than this guy got him out of the situation. So reading those things is really important. Body language and posture, there was nothing aggressive that this player was doing. He was actually trying to help a fellow player on the field not get in any further trouble. Coaches are in good. Nobody's noticed a problem there. Notice the fourth official. Really excellent work here. No need to run over there. There's going to be three referees. The fourth official doesn't need to go. He does go and stand right in front of a bench that's crowded up on the line. So this is a really excellent job from this fourth official to make sure that he's blocking people who might have run out there out onto the field. So really excellent positioning here from this fourth. This is an ideal place for you to go if you find yourself in a situation like this. Go to the nearest bench to the situation and put your body there and just look at them. You don't need to go help over there. They got three people who can help over there. This is really excellent awareness from this fourth official. We can talk about whether or not this coach should come onto the field to confront him, but as long as it's just a decent conversation, we're not gonna worry about it. The last part of this is that this entire thing just takes too long. So there's a little trick that we can use as referees. You're going to get surrounded. Everybody's going to try to influence you. He's already pointing at the back pocket. We know he's going to go red. But now all these other players don't let him do it. There continues to be more scrum. We still have this goalkeeper in here causing problems. So what can we do to speed this whole thing up? Because if I let the whole video go, you would see that this entire situation takes about two and a half to three minutes. We still have a goalkeeper that won't get out of this. These are problems for us, right? A little trick that we can use, particularly when you're right next to the touchline, walk off the field. It seems simple. It seems stupid, but just walk off the field. Because if a player leaves the field of play, it's an immediate yellow card. And you can tell them that. If you follow me off the field, I'm going to give you a yellow card. 
and pull it out. Have it ready to go. It's a warning sign for everybody. If you come over here, you're going to get this. Instead, the referee tries to convince everybody to leave him and the AR alone so they can talk. That's all they need to do. They just need to talk here. And he's trying to convince everybody, go away. Let me talk to this guy. I need to talk to the AR. Because what we learned here after the game is that this referee actually lost the track of the number of the player he needed to send off. But he knew the AR had him. And so he needed to talk to the AR to get that information. But the players won't leave him alone to actually have the conversation. So if you need to be left alone, if you need physical space from the players, and you find yourself at the touch line, just step off the field. Go off the field, take your colleague with you, and that creates the physical separation that you need. Another trick you can use, if you know you're going to send a player off, just pull the red card out. Nothing stops a player shorter than just pulling out a red card. This is a tactic you can use carefully, but if you use it the right way, everybody knows not to come and mess with you because you got a red card in your hand. I've seen a referee notice that a player was going to come and yell at him after a game from 50 yards away, and he just took the red card out of his pocket and stood there. That player stopped running towards the referee and left the field because he didn't want to get a red card. So whether you're going to use the red card or not can be irrelevant, but in this case, when you know you're going to send a player off, just pull it off. Pull it out, have it in your hand, let everybody see it, and when somebody comes over to you, you can very easily say, do you want one too? That's going to send a message you're not to be trifled with and they need to walk away. And if you combine that with walking off the field a couple of steps, now you can say it's an empty thread. It's not true, but you can say, if you step over that line, I'm going to send you off. I got the red card right here in my pocket. It's a good way to cut two minutes out of this situation and a lot of consternation, a lot of frustration, and a lot of anger. You shortcut a lot of that if you take that kind of approach. So at the end of the day, Referee finds the right player, takes him a second. You can see he doesn't know where he is, who is it, finally has to get it, gives the red card correctly. And then I'm not sure where in this, but he actually finds the goalkeeper. Here it is, gives the goalkeeper a yellow card as well. Finds the goalkeeper. We got a problem here. Gives the yellow card. When I talked about balance earlier, this is excellent balance here. We've taken care of what we need to take care of. You've issued the right misconduct. Nobody else from the other team has done anything wrong, so there's no need to issue any other misconduct here. The team in blue has been the guilty party. They have not done anything wrong. No need to punish them. So it's a dense clip. There's a lot to it, but a lot that we can learn from it. So a question here, would you go straight red or double yellow send off on this play? The answer is this is a red card. If a player commits one offense and then commits a separate offense that is by itself worthy of a red card, you punish the more severe. So here we have a player who commits a yellow card tackle, but then hits somebody in the face. We don't worry about the first yellow card tackle. We just show a red card for the punch to the face. We had a question here. I understand the fourth should not put his back to the field while controlling the bench. Can we touch on that? Uh, I would actually say the thing that he needed to be paying attention to at that moment was the bench. So because the rest of everything going on is 70 plus yards away from him, and because he knows there are three people there watching it, he can divert his attention from there to what it really needs to be on, which is the bench. So there's actually not a problem with turning your back to the field in this situation because you're doing that to keep an eye on the thing that actually requires the bulk of your attention, particularly when you know you've got three colleagues out there already taking care of the rest. You don't need to have your back to, or you, you don't need to have your, your, your chest facing the field at all the times, particularly when you've got other colleagues that are watching it. So no problem here with the fourth official turning their back to the field because the thing they needed to actually pay attention to was in front of them. Question here, is this a situation for game management? What does the game need? By calling the first foul and giving White a free kick? Yeah, you know what? There's, there's probably an argument for that. We, we, we start the clip right there. So we actually don't know what happened here. 
and this is an attacking free kick. It's still early. This is a professional league. If this player is not actually guilty of a foul, we don't get to make one up here. And again, because this clip starts sort of mid-action, we don't really know if this player has actually committed a foul here. You can see this player's arm is wrapped around him. Maybe they're both holding each other. I really am not sure. If it's a legitimate foul, then yes, you avoid this whole thing by appropriately calling the foul. If this is in the middle of the field, meaning if it's in the middle third somewhere, if this is happening in the center circle, the answer absolutely is yes. Give a simple foul to the team that's down 3-0 just to keep their emotions under control. But in and around the penalty area, we have to be a little bit more careful. We don't want to give away cheap fouls in and around the penalty area. But a good question nonetheless, though. Is the tackle a caution or a send-off? We would have a caution for the tackle if he hadn't hit the guy in the face. So the tackle itself is just a caution, reckless challenge. Question here, any trick on keeping track of the player you need to sanction? Um, get his number if you can. I would argue, though, this mass confrontation has gone to hell enough that we don't need to get in the middle of it and try to sort it all out. So I would actually advise that that AR just hold on to the guilty party and never leave his side. Just hold him there the whole time. You don't need to go and do anything else. There's, it's too big of a mass confrontation by that point to actually get involved with anything else. So just stick with the player you know needs to get a, a, a red card. If for some reason you have to leave him, if something really pressing needs your attention, make sure you get his number. Numbers are going to be the quickest thing to, uh, to, to look for. I would not advise that you use uh, the shoes or a haircut or anything else like that because the last thing you need to do is confuse one player or another and try to send off the wrong player. I, I've actually made that mistake myself sometimes. Mike Adams, I'm going to uh, request that you not make comments because, again, you hear you've provided incorrect information. So you've said here, if you pull the card, you must use it. That is not correct. If you pull a card out and you discover it's wrong or somebody gives you incorrect information, you can put it back in your pocket. You don't have to use it. It's going to look bad, but you don't have to use it. So please limit your comments to questions, please. So a question here, because the referee waited so long, should he forego the caution and just show the red card since it was the same player, or should he still caution the foul? I actually commented on that a moment ago. If a player commits one foul that's, guilty, that, that's worthy of a yellow card and immediately does something else that requires red, we punish the more severe of the two. We just go straight with a red card. What is it? So a question here, what is the specific misconduct for the keeper that uh, came from 75 yards away? It's a yellow card for unsporting behavior. Lastly, a question here, touching of the player by the AR, is that okay? A lot of it, as I said earlier, is going to depend on the level of the game. If you're doing a 19 boys game, these kids are in college already, these are adults. If you need to, to, to touch one of them to keep a fight from happening, I would encourage you to do that if it's safe to do so. If the fight's already going, don't touch anybody. Get out of there, get out of it. All right. I would like to correct myself here. I, would, I called out Mike Adams for making a comment. He actually asked a question. I, admit, I confused the words that he used. So Mike Adams, my apology. His specific sentence was, if you pull the card, must you use it? I read it as, if you pull the card, you must use it. So my apologies, Mike, and thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I, I incorrectly brought attention to you. Thank you for asking the question. If you pull the card, you don't have to use it. And again, my apologies, Mike. Anybody else, any questions on this one? This is a dense clip. All right. Thank you for joining this evening. I hope you got something out of it. And everybody, I wish you, again, uh, safe health and a good evening. Bye-bye, everybody.